but I'm from Bethany. Hallelujah. It's a little town outside of Jerusalem. Yes. And that's where I live with my brother and my sister. My sister's name was Martha, my brother's name was Lazarus. And I was sent here to tell my story. Well, Jesus was in Bethany. It was a couple of days before the Passover. Uh, at the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. Uh, Passover was a big deal, much like your Independence Day. Uh, and it was celebrated every year. Uh, celebrated the time when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. And the death angel passed over that door. That was a big deal. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread was one of the activities before the Exodus the next morning. And so Jesus was in Bethany. There were a lot of people in Bethany celebrating the feast of the Passover. And Jesus wasn't really popular. I mean, people who embraced him embraced him. Uh, but there were a lot of people, the keepers of the law, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they didn't like Jesus because they were he was messing with their power. But Jesus was out preaching and teaching and and healing people, and I had heard about it. I had heard that he was healing the sick and diseased. I had heard that he had raised a little girl up after she had died, and um, all of these, he was telling stories. He would sit and teach people and tell stories. People could understand life's lessons, so to speak. Um, and I had even heard that he had chose these disciples and these followers of his, and he was teaching them what to do, how to treat people. Um, and, and one day I heard that when they were teaching, there were a lot of people around, and he, he had fed 5,000 men, not to even mention yes. the women and children. 5,000, but got this little boy, had two little fish and five loaves of bread, and yes. fed over 5,000 people. I had heard about that. Yes. And then not long after that, he fed 4,000 more people mm. with seven loaves of bread and some fish. I had heard about all of that. But even more important was I had a personal encounter with Jesus the Christ on several occasions. One was he came to my house and had dinner with my brother Lazarus and my sister Martha. My sister Martha got upset with me that day. Because all I wanted to do was sit at the feet of Jesus. All I wanted to do was sit and listen to him talk and teach. You know, and she was worrying me about cooking and cleaning and all of that. And then Jesus shut her down. He said, look, leave her alone. She's in the right place. Then there was one other time my brother Lazarus got sick. Jesus didn't get there in time to heal him. And my brother died. And when Jesus finally got there, Jesus was sad himself. You know, because he loved Lazarus. Yes. And so the unthinkable happened. He went to the tomb. And when he got to the tomb, he said, all he did was call Lazarus' name. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And I was like, what? I had heard all about what Jesus had done, but hadn't experienced it yet. And so Jesus came out, called Lazarus' name. Lazarus got up. Burial clothes and all. And walked out of that tomb. You I was like, oh my. But this particular day, I was going to tell you about it. I had heard Jesus was at Simon's house, you know, having dinner again. And Simon, they call him Simon the leper, because that was another one of Jesus' miracles. He suffered from leprosy. He couldn't go around anybody, and Jesus healed him. So, you all know Jesus had to eat because he was part human. So he was in Simon's house eating dinner. And when I heard he was at Simon's house, I was like, oh, I need to get over there. All I wanted to do was be in his presence. 
All I wanted to do was sit at his feet one more time. And, 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 and I, I said to myself, what is it that I can do? I don't want to go empty-handed this time. I just, I just want to be there with him. I want to spend time and space with Jesus the Christ. Because, see, I knew what was going to happen. He had been trying to tell his disciples on several occasions that he was going to have to go through something. And that he was... He was um, going to be d disliked, that he was going to be disgraced, and some he was going to be punished, and he was going to die. And, 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 and they missed it. Because all they were talking about was who going to sit on his right, who going to sit on his left. Oh, we got you, man. We got you, master. Ain't nothing going to happen to you. They missed the whole point. Amen. But I believed it. I believed what he said. And so I wanted to one more time be in Jesus' presence. Yes. And so, what could I do? What could I care? What could I do? I grabbed the most precious thing I had. My alabaster jar. And, and, it, and it had some expensive oil in it that I used for perfume. And, and it was made from an expensive and, and rare plant. And, and I said, what can I do to show Jesus, how much I loved him and how much I appreciated what he had done in my life and the life of my family. How could I show Jesus how much I loved him? And so I took the most precious thing I had and I went to Simon's house and there he was. He was customary when somebody important came to your house uh, back then. It was customary to, to pour oil on their head because that showed that you honored them. But not only did I pour oil on Jesus' head, when Jesus sat down, I took my, my bowl and I put it down by his feet and I took Jesus' feet and I put it in my bowl. And, and when I put it in my bowl, I. I anointed his feet. I, I, I poured oil on his feet and over his head. And, and the room was just filled with the fragrance of the oil. And, and, and Jesus was looking at me and his eyes fixed on mine. And I, I kept saying to myself, I came by this moment. It's more precious than the oil that I have. And so, there were other people in the room who started to mumble and grumble and, and said, well, why are you taking that expensive oil and pouring it on his feet? You wasted, you could, you could sell that and give the money to the poor. Jesus shut them down again. He told them, you leave her alone because she has anointed me for burial. Amen. And what he said next changed my life forever. He told them, when the good news is preached all over the world, that what she did today is going to be talked about and remembered until the end of time. You know what that did for me? That changed my life forever. And from that point on, I went around telling people about the sweet presence of Jesus and how I sat in front of him and how, how, how he changed my life. Just because I sacrificed the most precious thing I had. See, this was the most valuable thing I had in my possession. And I shared it with Jesus. But I don't have much time. I, I got to go in a few minutes, but but I, uh, I need to tell you some things. When 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 I grabbed my jaw and, and I and I encountered Jesus in Simon's house that day, one of the things that I did was I broke the jaw. I broke it purposefully. Because what that signified to me was breaking. The, my past. I broke the jaw of my past. Because I knew when I broke that jaw, 
there was no turning back. I couldn't go back and pick up stuff that I had already done that Jesus had forgiven me for. So breaking your alabaster jar means that you can't go back to what you was and what you've been. That jar represents your heart. Now, not only can you go back, but you're breaking open your heart as well. Amen. Breaking it wide open so God can take control of everything. Amen. And so, breaking that jar is a radical move. Mm -hmm. And so when, you, when I broke it, I knew I could never use that jar again. Mm -hmm. So when you break open your heart and forget your past, Jesus has already forgotten it. You're breaking up with your heart to receive your future. Your future in Jesus Christ. Yes. But listen. Once the break, the jar is open. Your heart is open to God. Then what will happen is you will be able, just like I poured that oil out on Jesus, you'll be able to pour out your praise and worship on him. For so what he's doing in your life. the jar of your life. That alabaster jar of your heart is open now to what God has for you. Yeah. Do you know he has plans for you? Yeah. Plans to prosper you. Yeah. Plans to make your life abundant. Yeah. But you gotta break the jar yeah. and let him in. Yeah. But listen, don't be fooled. Because just like it was folk in that room who thought what I was doing was foolish, this is going to be folk in your life that's going to look at you and say, what in the world? Why are you spending so much time in church? Why are you sacrificing your, your, your hard-earned paycheck to give to the church? Why are you sacrificing your time to the church? Why are you going to go clean up the temple? Why are you changing that light bulb? Ain't they got folks to do that for you? Why are you doing that? Because now you've broken the box. You've broken the jar. And your radical praise and your radical worship takes the shape of almost anything in the kingdom. Sing it. Can you sing? I don't do well. But I can pull out my praise. I can make a joy for Noah. And so can you. You can use your gifts, your talents, your skills. Because I got, I got radical news for you. Everything you have don't even belong to you. Not in your life. It already belongs to God. So once the jar is broken and open, and you pour out, you giving back to him, what he gave to you already, you're sacrificing it back to him. Don't let nobody like they did on me that day, tell you what you can't do for God. Amen. Because he poured it on you, Amen. and you're pouring it back into the kingdom, Amen. honoring him. You can honor him in so many different ways. Sacrifice, service, whatever your heart's desire. But that's the key. Your heart's desire has to be for him. Yeah. How you value your own life? Yeah. Do you value it enough, your life in Christ, to give everything you have to him? Yeah. That was something in the scrolls in Matthew that I read before I came and said, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Yeah. And so is your heart with God? Is your treasure with God? Because if it is, he'll bless you beyond measure. Yeah. That's how he defends you. Remember he defended me that day? He defends you by pouring out blessings in your life. Pouring out things that you need. Pouring out desires that you, you have in your life. That's how he defends you. And so you can walk proudly. And when somebody questions what you're doing in the kingdom, you tell them, I'm pouring out my praise on you. So he can pour blessings back on me. Because guess what? Jesus sacrificed Everything he had. He gave his only begotten son. He gave the most precious thing he had. And that was his son. And then when the son came, he said that he came to fulfill the prophecy. He came to set the captives free. He came to heal the brokenhearted and the wounded. So he sacrificed 
so we could have yeah. an abundant yeah. life. Yeah. That's why he went to the cross. Amen. I knew he was going. I believed he was going, yeah. but he also told the disciples, yeah. they missed this part. Uh, I'm going to get up. Yeah. I'm coming back. Yeah. I'm coming back, and when I come back, that's when you're going to have grace. Yes. That's when you're going to have mercy. Yes. That's when you're going to have a covering over your life yes. that nobody is going to understand but you Amen. and me. Amen. 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 I got to go. <laughs> well, let me leave you with this. Break the jar. Yes. Open your heart. Yes. The alabaster jar is not yours. The key mm -hmm. It's for you to give it back. To God yes. through the resurrected Jesus yes. because he did get up yes. so that you could have you. abundant life. Yes. And to sauce, that's goodbye and good. <laughs>